quite a lot of activity trucks that they were coming from the uh, south and headed uh, to the north look like wild dogs were busy and dogs here pretty much late uh, maybe early early this morning but uh, we were full and trucks look like uh, uh, total span coming very direct into the west we are checking here if trucks is cross over or not but uh, we still have to check the direction of these dogs where they ended but look like they headed across to the north it will be best for us to go and check sandy patch uh, north towards sydney's dam on that uh, area maybe we might be lucky to find the wild dogs for the morning because there were a lot of tracks look like they come out from simbondili they didn't come all the way down from the south heading to the north just come from one eye pen straight direct to the uh, north direction looking forward for the great morning of course and the tracks of a leopard look like uh, it's really promising it's a very fresh tracks with a slew of potential dangers lurking it's essential to be aware of your surroundings whilst walking in the wilderness 20 yards away from one of the most endangered species this is a big bull. What a moment, what a close encounter with an Ellie bull. He's just over here now. He's moved completely away. Being on a bushwalk and seeing a leopard, I mean, it's ridiculous to be this close to a leopard on foot and for him not to run is absolutely insane. How crazy was that? Through the gap there is just the back of the head of a male lion. He is absolutely unaware that we are here right now. I tell you, seeing lions on foot, is, it, it, it definitely brings out the caveman in you, this little scared human being. Of course, I was coming here to check a leopard or wild dogs. So lucky to find these tracks. I just want to see further towards the uh, Impala Plain, if there's any tracks, otherwise I will be rushing back straight to the north and try to check that area. You might find that because towards Sandy Pitch North, Sydney, is, it's a very open space. Wild dog would like to spend their time, especially at night or oh, while it's still dark. They cannot just move around in the area without uh, really seeing what might be around. It couldn't be so much dangerous. Having a pride of lions in the area, they tend to be not moving that uh, uh, far at night. They would find a very suitable area and able to lie down where they can able to see. It's a dead animal species. It doesn't mean that uh, at night they cannot see, but tend to be really avoid to hunt at night. If a lion approach them at night, they can able to move away from the spot and go and find another spot to lie down. So it's really common to find wild dog. Once they engage with anything dangerous, they can move at night. I was hoping maybe the tracks of uh, male leopard will come out here, yeah? but it look like uh, only hyenas. I know that turtle pen, he likes it in route. You might be concentrating on the road. I was hoping for spotted cat or wild dog. Let's cross finger for that. I'm working on it. I can see uh, there's no tracks here for the cross pen mal. He might be still down towards the impala plane because he likes certain area to, to walk. Especially this time of uh, day where the grass are still a little bit uh, having dew, you find that leopard concentrate on the road than walking into the tall grasses because they can get wet and it's cold. They don't like that a lot. Leopard concentrate on the road. Let's see if we can go towards uh, the Impala Plain or Transformer. There's an area called Transformer. And if there's no tracks there, we will be heading back and north on the corridor, a road that uh, is parallel with this Triple M called Impala Plain Road. Uh, 
hoping that uh, I might get more evidence on that road. Or find the leopard itself, who knows? We'll take this opportunity and go over to Chris and see what opportunity he has done in Prideland. We're going to start off with our quiz. Start off with relatively easy ones. Remember how it works? Three questions. You write them down. They are numbered from 1 to 20 if we get to 20. And then you basically keep your own score. And we're going to start off with this one. So first one. Just look how beautiful these tracks are made. All right. What do we have there? It's a bird. Railway track, zigzag. You can see those banana shaped sort of toes. And I'm gonna give you a size imprint. So we can you can basically see them. There's five centimeters. There's so just to give an idea of the size of that. Short gait. So that's question number one, and the question is what bird was walking here? It's an important bird for us in tracking since it is an indicator of time. It puts time to a track. If it's on top of a track or if a track is on top of it. So it's a very important bird for us to know in tracking. It's not something we will track, but it's the track and sign that's very important to us in that respect. For us to know, is it worthwhile tracking a creature or not? Question number one, what bird is that? <laughs> Easy one, I'm sure. Right, question number two. I'm gonna up it a little bit. Easy animal, just walked in a very funny fashion. Question number two, you can see it's number two there. What animal made that track there? Very weird looking track. Right, you can see size wise again. About six centimeters, the total track, but there's a catch. There is a catch. And if BK zooms out a bit, I'll let you look at the rest of the sequence. And that should give you a good clue. The question number two What animal made that track over there? <laughs> I love these days. I love it. All right, and then let's give it another two or three seconds. And we're gonna head to question number three. Good morning, Jack. Thanks for joining the field quiz or field observation as we also refer to it yet, eco training, Pridelands with the students. It's a heck of a lot of fun, but also some good learning. Okay, question number three. Mm, I think it's an easy one, but you know, it's a difficult seeing it from a distance. But anyway, question number three. I am gonna give you no hints on this one. What I only will do is I'll point out what I'm, because there's other stuff happening here. There's an animal there. There's a thing and there's a thing. These two indentations, little conical bits, tiny little conical bits. And we want to know what creature made those two individual prints. And you can see they're very tiny. You can see they're not even a centimeter in width. Right, give it, a, give it a thought, write down your answers, and then on our next segment, we will reveal the answers and maybe one or two segments. In the meantime, let's get over to Cedric to see what he's up to.
Yes, and as you can see, we are at the Juma Clan Den site. A lot of activity happening here. So we've got uh, Corky Far End, we've got Ntima, we've got Swazi, Ndebele, and uh, of course all the little cubs around here, up and down, all over the show. So yes, definitely the Juma Clan's uh, Den site is very active. As you can see, it looks like Ndebele, that side there with Corky. And uh, like, uh, Corky's youngster there as well, uh, with her. But she's uh, really resting. And then, of course, coming up to the one now coming up that's lying there now is in Timo. She's also quite, quite passed out. A lot of full tummies here this morning. Definitely quite a few of them, as you can see. Oh, no, oh that's Ruben, sorry. It's Ruben on that side. Just, just got up there. As we got here, it looks like she's moving off. Oh, don't come here now. No, leave the car alone. It's not for you. So, yes, so definitely had a good uh, feed last night. You can, uh, a lot of uh, real swollen tummies. And I think, uh, I think, especially if you can see Swazi, she is, it looks like she has uh, swallowed a beach ball and lying with that a real big uh, tummy of her. So, no, that's not her cup. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Team is still there. Of course, and uh, and Swazi still just resting, and then the bella as well in the hole. And the yeah, little cubs earlier started to a little bit of complaining going down there, which is just, which is very good. Uh, I didn't copy the name. I think uh, sorry, Julie. Just uh, please repeat that uh, the name again. But uh, um, yes, definitely the whole gang is yeah, again very nice. As you can see, oh, the two little ones playing. There's little Corky and Timus Cub. So Timus Cub is, a, I mean, a Corky's Cub is the one on the left and Tima on the right. Looks like Timus Cub is a little bit darker at the bottom. There's Tima now going straight to Mom, and Corky's Cub is on the left hand side there. <laughs> I feel a little bit of, I think she's definitely passed up, but those, those little two cubs are having a bit of a, a bit of a game this morning, a nice early morning game, before I'm sure they will go to the for the day. Oh, I love it when these cubs are so active. Luckily, the, well, this morning is not that cold. It's nice and fresh, but it's not that cold at all. I don't even know why I went in and put too long pants on. Yes, but please send any suggestions if anybody's really in the mood to see. Oh, a certain species. <laughs> Sorry, that, that little cub just decided to try and tackle a, a little stick and it went right over. <laughs> uh, typical kids. 
playing around with any little toy and stick and, and whatever they can get hold of. They're really very active. Cindy, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us on our Sunrise Safari. Uh, at what age? Well, so Cindy's, they don't, I mean, if you look at Hart's uh, cupboard, started moving off with adults the other day when I saw the chiller pan. I mean, that was, uh, what, about four months, four months old, five months, four, five months. So really at four or five months they start, looks like they start uh, wandering off a little bit uh, with the adults. <clears throat> Not far, they don't go and do, of course, you know, great distances like the adults to go and look for uh, kills and to go and scavenge on something, but uh, they do start venturing further and further and further. So it does, it's one step at a time, they don't just immediately decide to start going far. So they just start getting a little bit of uh, courage and uh, confidence in moving away from that area of safety and then once they can feel that they are strong enough and big enough to to move far and move with adults and yeah that's i'm sure that is pretty much almost like a half a year to a year old and slowly we really start moving through but we've also had i remember a previous lodge where i've had uh, a young uh, hyenas coming into the lodge by themselves no adults around i'm talking about maybe a six seven month old adult uh, hyenas and uh, <laughs> that one just felt like a tortoise. You can, you can get up. Oh, no, it's, it's in loving it. And, uh, while we watch these little cubs having a, a ball of a time, yeah, let's head over to Rex and while he's, uh, he's got uh, a big grey animal. Welcome back from Cedric. We are lucky coming across with the breeding heart of the elephant looking for a tracks of a leopard in the area. We just come across with this head of a, a elephant, look like more than 10 to 15. It, it could be more than that because it's a little bit uh, thick here. And we have this beautiful, uh, nice female elephant that's walking in front of us. A lot more relaxed. This animal. Are such amazing if you look at the elephant the coat itself is very thick and it depends in most cases when the animal is healthy in the area you'd never find that particular animal feeling uh, or fearing from the weather if it's too cold you might find them into the open if they feel like very cold they need to move into the very thick stuff and due to the season around in the area if you look at the grass where the eye it tells that all the animals or herbivore species that also they can be so well uh, fed in the area and very well healthy when it comes to physical health of the species itself because they're eating high nutritious grass around the area that's reason we find quite a lot of uh, elephants in this particular farm and uh, driving around here have seen uprooting of roots quite a lot in the surrounding look like uh, elephant like uh, eating the roots because all the trees are very healthy uh, storing all the nutritious, um, I mean, water or nutritious uh, uh, roots in, in this area where the elephant like to dig on that because due to the rain, it rains a lot towards the end of uh, winter and the trees. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. 
for those in the southern hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Remember elephants, they have a very strong sense of smell. They can really find out even from the ground. If there's anything that is highly nutritious as far as bulb or roots, they can smell that and start to dig in some of these uh, tree plants we see in front of us. Here we're in a major quarry. This kind of a tree is elephant doesn't really like the most to uh, dig the roots or eat them. They do eat them especially when they feel like they are having a problem in the body system, like a digestive system, system having a little bit of problem. Remember, the magic guari trees, it hosts a lot of tannins. So it helps quite a lot on the elephant if they are sick to really, uh, uh, I mean, uh, browse or, or eat the roots, of course, than uh, uh, other species of a plant in that area. Quite a lot. If you look at the Combritan, elephant likes going for Combritan than anything else. Look at the young uh, elephant there. It's really giving a little bit of entertaining, I mean, with the uh, crested Franklin to, to find like uh, teasing the Franklin or chasing Franklin because they have a lot of energy. It's very common. For the young elephant to find them, anything that comes close, they will try to really interact with it. This reason is more important if you out in a bush driving here. If you find a young elephant, try to really intimidate your vehicle. You have to stand still because it's how actually the young bulls learn how we really behave out in the bush. If you drive faster away, they learn to chase vehicle as they grow up. But if you stand still, they learn to respect the vehicle quite a lot. It's one of the species that the highly intelligent, they can learn. Remember, these are animals that can react with the body language of anything. It could be a vehicle. If you ref a vehicle, it means you're challenging. If you challenge them, they can respond. If the elephant challenge you and not to move, switch off, they can really know that a vehicle is stronger than whatever he might be thinking. Again, he's looking at us and try to really, as you can hear me speaking, he's trying to intimidate that uh, we have to move out. If you really move, you'll learn that uh, he's stronger than the vehicle and it will be very dangerous for any vehicle that comes around in the area. But apart of that, we know that um, elephant in a society on a breeding head like this, they tend to listen to the uh, matriarch. Even if the youngster try to do all of that, a matriarch even get uh, to command, you would never participate or encourage by the young one to push vehicle. They were all going to be doing their own thing, not getting interested. Even if the young start trumpeting, the mother or matriarch will con continuously moving in the same direction. And that, it will teach the youngster that this is something that you know, you're not going to interact. But if a lion, a leopard, water comes into the area, one trumpeting of the youngster, it will attract the whole head to go and fight that particular predators move off into that surrounding. The reason behind that, they can, I mean, lion can hunt, young, hunt youngster, and it happens sometimes. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show.
We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day Safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! We're looking at this particular female direct to us. You can tell that she's an old female. How can you tell? If you zoom direct to the head of the uh, elephant, you can see the indentation where it sunks down. If you see the head, like you can see that uh, head skeleton, it tells you that uh, the particular individual is very old. If you pick one another, it will be different. Some of the elephant, you can still, they still have a round kind of a head where you cannot see the indentation that tells you it's a young a female. But this one, it can be around 40 years uh, plus minus, if I'm not mistaken. If I can take a look of one individual, you can see the difference of the age of an elephant is how actually you can tell the age of an uh, elephant whether it's a male or female it tells it's like us human being you can see in a inner kind of your eye if you have those wrinkles you tend to be a little bit old and this elephant you see indentation Uh, seven year old, uh, I, I didn't copy well. Uh, you may be asking who is the oldest in, in this head? If I, I get it right, Maredo look like uh, it's not right this uh, morning. But uh, with this individual, Yes, Carl, you, you're asking a very clever question. Oh, look at this youngster. Come, boy. Come, boy. <laughs> Trying to intimidate, as I was saying earlier on. If you move, it can be so much different. Carl, yes, the elephant can feel cold. It depends on the condition of an elephant. If the can oh, elephant is not healthy, it doesn't eat well, it's losing weight, like we have, we have seen with the Mohawk and Blondie, Yes, an elephant, uh, it can feel cold, but uh, in that scenario, if an elephant is healthy in the body system, you have collected quite a lot of food during winter or during summer and end of the winter, and the body, um, the physical body is healthy, I don't think it will be feeling cold. Something here, I don't know why. This female tend to be not happy with us. But uh, it cannot be, maybe it could be the machine in the vehicle because they can really sense that. Or it could be something that vibrated um, in the direction of the vehicle. Suddenly she's running away and look at directed to your vehicle. You see how intimidated uh, that elephant ears are folding, ears are opening up and facing the vehicle. Look as an enemy, it's a threat, of course. Let's take this opportunity and uh, go over to Cedric and try to follow up this uh, elephant and enjoy Cedric. Yes, uh, I've just left the hyena den. Um, what have I got here? Sorry, don't. Uh, uh, no, I, uh, hyena tracks. Hyena tracks. We left the, the Juma clan. I think uh, one or two of the adults just uh, decided just to move off a little bit into the thickets there. Um, but we are going to continue. I'm coming up towards the Niala South area from where we had those line tracks from yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning, in fact. Just want to see where did they come out and uh, maybe follow up on them. Um, but we did have those lines calling north of our camp. 
Uh, yes, yes. And also Molawati. I saw uh, Rexon showed me a couple of the photos and that and Khat as well. And uh, with Molawati, it's so nice to see him. But uh, apparently, he is the he is the ghost of uh, Juma. And. Uh, uh, they were telling me yesterday when they found him, he was uh, almost backtracking into his own uh, into his own tail. So yeah, that is uh, really funny. Uh, and I know, and I was speaking to Rexon last night, and because um, I remember your Don that used to be in this area, and I know your Don used to be the same, uh, same used to do the same thing. So he used to kind of duck and dive around uh, bushes, but and Rex would say, yeah, but uh, Molawati, because I've seen Molawati once, and he says uh, Molawati is uh, like 20 times worse. So yeah, I can imagine. As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new dive live merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Yeah, I'm just uh, taking a look because all those hyenas at the uh, at the um, at the den itself, they all had very much. Um, oops, sorry, I just got caught there. Uh, very full bellies. So uh, I'm just taking a look. There's a lot of hyena tracks back and forth on this road on the island uh, south. So I'm just gonna see where they did lead to or where did they come from. So it maybe kind of uh, gives us an idea on uh, where to go. Yeah, but I am looking forward to the lumber at this point in time. Because I just want to see, I just want to see if we can uh, follow up and find tracks of hers and see if everything is hunky dory with that lumber and her two cubs. After yesterday, she was a little bit frantic. So yes, but uh, while we continue up uh, Niyala South, uh, let's head over to Chris in Pridelands to continue his bird quiz. Gonna wait for some answers on this one. Remember the question number one. What bird made this track? And while we wait, again we can see the, the sort of very close gate almost touching each other, the banana shaped toes. Megan, good morning. Megan says Franklin. Good morning, Megan. Not a Franklin. And Franklin's have a much longer gate, bigger track and they won't have a pronounced back toe. There will only be an indentation. To quickly show you while I wait for another track. So with Franklin's, you're gonna have, it's a much bigger track. With Franklin's you'll have more a uh, sort of long toe, long toe, long toe, and just like a little point there. Much bigger than that. Jerry at Nodda Stenborg. Good morning, Jerry. This is a bird, by the way. Um, but the key here is the fact that they are walking very short gait, almost touching each other. You can see toes and that banana curved middle toe and almost like the hind toe and the front toe fuses. Right foot, left foot. We actually have a term for that if somebody walks like that. Okay. I'm going to reveal the answer because we need to get through some of them. Right. It is a dove. 
It is a dove. If we look at that banana-shaped toe, like I said, so this would be the right foot, you see. So often that toe shows as one single toe, and you've got this sort of zigzag train, train-like thing. Right, so answer to question number one will be a dove. Can't tell you exactly which one. It's very likely to be a Cape turtle dove, looking at the size. But the answer, if you said it's a dove, you have one point. Right, question number two. What animal made that track over there? Like I said, there's a tricky one, but not a tricky animal. Jerry Steenbock. If we look at the size, good morning, Jerry. Steenbock. It's got a very tiny track, very thin. And it's not a Steenbock. It's actually much bigger. This is an Impala. Now, what's confusing people here? There's the normal track, very clearly an Impala. You see the rim on the outside, very pronounced, arrow shaped. But here, what happened is one Impala went that way, which is probably the same animal and another Impala went that way. So there's one track that stepped onto another track. This is not registering. This is two individual animals that moved in different directions. You can see there the Impala that went that way. Here is the Impala that went that way. So that's answer to question number two is an Impala. That's why I said it's a tricky one. Number three let's just find number three where is number three where did we do number three yeah right Lika is gonna try and zoom in for us you see the sun is making it there's some lot of good contrast coming in there so what creature made that trunk it is an insect and it's the larval stage of a typical group group of insects Good morning, Megan. Spot on. It is indeed an antline, even though it's a very small one. But yes, those conical trap pits that they dig in the sand to trap terrestrial insects is very diagnostic. And they also make very distinct tracks in the sand, little lines, little sort of undulating, curving lines in the sand. And yes, this is the larval stage of one of the antline species. Not exactly sure which one but it is a very small one. Correct, 100%, that is an ant line. Right, I reckon we should try and scout out for some interesting stuff a little bit further ahead. Okay. I'm going to move a little bit closer towards the dam, and then in the meantime, let's go over to Rexon, who's at the dam. Welcome back from Chris. We are still with this uh, elephant. Usually, elephants are very peaceful animal, and sometimes you tend to see them reacting if there's any threat or challenges around themselves, like what we have seen earlier on. Suddenly, one of the female coming towards the vehicle and raising his head up and ears, try to understand what might be. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, 
then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Hullabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hahina at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of hahina celebrations. And sometimes again, that is the third one, they, they may look at the threat uh, and spreading the ears out, standing still, not to move. And you have to know that uh, it could be a very good sign that the elephant, they really feel like uncomfortable with anything that might be in the surrounding. Especially walking in the area, if you tend, if you tend to see an elephant, all of them raising their head up, uh, uh, facing your direction, if you feel like the elephant, they're going to really charge. Please don't ever try to hide into thick bushes. Try to be in the open where they can see you, your movement, or stand still in the open. They will eventually drop the head down because they can see what you're up to. But asking if it's always a matriarch, an oldest female in a head. Sometimes it's not necessary to be old. It looks like it's something that uh, it's really, you get selected from generation to the next. It's like a bloodline, I believe. Sometimes, yes, it's an oldest female that really knows the area very well. But you may find that uh, a, a young female in an age where there's an old female within the head becomes a matriarch. And how can you see that in most cases he's the one that gives signal and leads the rest? Then you can tell that uh, this has become a matriarch. If she signal like really vocalizing, all of them stop not to move. And that uh, tells you that it becomes more matriarch. But that is our imagination. It could be right, it could be wrong. But in most cases, it's not always the oldest. But you tend to see 80% an oldest female within the structure of the head, it become a matriarch. And uh, you remember there's a first matriarch and a second matriarch. If one becomes old and uh, really not participating to control the second in charge, she's the one that she can take over. And again, if it happens that uh, they're both or one died, it will be one that's selected within the head. It's like what happened in into the structure of the community, local communities around. Having a headman and a second headman is something that gets selected uh, according to the experience of the uh, members of the village. It could be the same. It could be the experience and how actually you respond on matters when it comes to within the structure society of the breeding head itself. That you become uh, selected by the rest of the head, that you become a matriarch. Early girl seems like loving the little ones, but now and then it seems like, um, yes, it, it's looking beautiful, the young ones. Let me go to the comment. But with this head, it looks like they have uh, a history of a night. If you look at this female, she's turning around and not happy. It's not just because of Vyaka. I was thinking that uh, it could be just because we were there and we're not moving. It looks like the female itself, they might have a, a, a difficult night. Maybe they've engaged lions and other species. It could be wild dogs. Anything that can be moving in the area, they tend to respond on it. Find a way into, into the kill to eat. Get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. 
This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog sword started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. Amazing, you can see them. They're all walking a horse slowly, and the one look like putting the little one in front, and the one really let the youngster behind. This is a very good sign that in between the two mothers, the youngster they always protect it. There's nothing that can touch them. Remember, as I was saying earlier on, the elephant are a lot more protective when it comes to the little ones, more especially in the grouping like this. It really really mean a lot to protect the youngster so you never ever come across with a head of elephant on foot you need to know what you're doing and you need to know to read the lines if you don't really the elephant they might kill you because they think like uh, protecting the youngster as we human beings we're the the biggest or the highest uh, kind of a predators in a hierarchy to compete with all species out in nature. There's reason a lion having a youngster see come across with human wind and food, you will try to protect a mating pair of a lion or a leopard. It will be the same, even a leopard having a youngster, it will really protect the youngster from us growling and charging. It will, it will take place. So you need to know what you're doing. If you're not in challenge, you need to show the leopard or elephant that you're not uh, really challenging. With an elephant, you have to be in an open space, completely don't hide. If you go behind the bushes and termites, or you might uh, have problem, or run away, you have problem. The best thing that I would advise is to go on top of the termite in the highest point. Then you become more uh, really uh, in an open space than to see you easily. Angelie, you're asking a, a very clever question that I would like also to comment on it earlier on. It's, it's one of the species, of course, if you look at the ecosystem, is doing the great job. I mean, having a very poor digestion system, it helps all the seeds and also everything that they really uh, get to uh, collect from the grass as uh, the form of the eggs from different um, small creatures as beetles and others to go through the digestion system and ferment some of the plant in order to germinate back into the soil system remember if an elephant it's a yeah, four chamber stomach and able to ruminate that there will be less kind of a seed that spread out in the surrounding if we look at the elephant down practically to uh, really able to um, state whatever i'm saying at the moment each and every elephant dung during winter or summer time quite a lot of uh, plant uh, material that germinated like amarulas, uh, crump thorns and quite more etc as far as uh, the uh, buffalo thorns a lot more seeds that comes live from the elephant dung also even now if you de elephant de defecate it after two three days you just roll the elephant dung you'll see how many life that inside that elephant dung lots of uh, small creatures as beetles crawling there quite a lot of things that um, really take place so that's reason they have a very poor digestive system in order to replant back all the plant material grass that they collect from one place to another so they spread out the seeds of different plant material around an area having a poor digestive system this is machine that plow back all whatever they collect it looks like they destroy quite a lot of environment but a lot of uh, the plant material and lot more small creatures that uh, they can revive or bo get born from through the disease system of an elephant soft.
Let's take this opportunity and uh, go over to Cedric, which is off from the vehicle. Yes, I'm on uh, Cheetah Cut Line, and as I came off uh, Central Road, I just came down Cheetah Cut Line a little bit, and all of a sudden we did pick up on, uh, looks like those lion tracks from yesterday morning that we did find uh, towards Vulture's Nest uh, and Yala South. And uh, of course, uh, I'll just take a look here. And got definitely one of the lion tracks here. And of course, another one over here. And it's quite a fit. I'm just going to go up a little bit and show a few this side. So if you can see what's happening here is we try and work it out. And by the size of this, uh, these tracks, it's definitely not those male uh, lines that we had last night. It's not for Mohawk or for uh, Blondie. Uh, their tracks will be way bigger. These are definitely for female lionesses and maybe for two or three females. It's no more than that. Um, there is no cubs involved here. There is no younger ones involved here as well. And uh, <coughs> just looking at a lot of these tracks, of course, a typical lion's got those three lobes. That's like, like a typical nice little heart with that extra lobe at the back. And of course, the four pugs. That's sits or along those ones. So they are heading up the side. This was definitely from this morning, early this morning. Um, I'm just taking a look if there's any other kind of disturbance on top of these tracks. It doesn't look like it. I mean, there's some of these tracks are very, very hard still, not much sand inside of it. The, contrast, uh, the, 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 the corners are still very, very sharp and it hasn't been disturbed uh, too much at this point in time. But it's definitely not for the male, uh, for males. It just looks like for three females that has gone up here, two or three females that has gone up that side. But on top of that, while well, we're going to see where these lion tracks do head off to, let's head back to Chris in Pridelands. I think he wants to do another bird quiz with everybody. Right, question number four. Okay, let's see what we got. I'm going to have to give you a hint on this one. This is one that even confuses guides. You got a pad with very distinct little creases in it. Very distinct. Then one, two, three, four toes. Blunt, long claws. Often these are like almost like fingers. They fuse the claw and the toe almost imprints as a as, okay, there that one stepped on top of it. And then there's a fifth toe. It often often just does this one, two, three uh, pad in, indentions and a claw. So that's the hind foot of this particular creature. I'm gonna have to give you a hint. This is a mongoose. And if you look at the size, it's not a small mongoose. All right, and there's another hint here in the track. Look at the size here. We're looking at about five centimeters in length. It's not a small mongoose. The other hint that we got, if you guys gonna pan out for us a bit. So the one clue is large, larger mongoose. It's not a massive mongoose. So it's not tiny. Digging, so there's blunt claws, not sharp claws. Because there's another mongoose you can confuse it with here. It's got very sharp claws. But there's another one here. And it's not the same specimen. Same animal, same species. There's them. There's another one there. There's another one there. So this tells us this is a mongoose that lives in groups. All right. Lots of hints there. You're going to have to get this. All right. It's not a difficult one given the hints. All right, so that is question number four. What mongoose species is this? So it's a gregarious mongoose. It's not a small mongoose. And it's also got blunt claws, very long claws. So it's a digging mongoose. Then question number five, it's not a track. It's related to this. So you have to get number four right in order to get question number five right. So in Southern Africa, or here, we have two types of gregarious mongoose or mongoose that lives in groups. So you're going to give me the answer of what is number four. Number five is which is the other one, the other species that are also in groups that lives in numbers. All right, you're going to have to let your brain work here. It's only two species. So you don't get number four right, you won't get number five right. All right. Question four, what gregarious mongoose made the track? 
Remember the size I showed you? Number five, which is the other mongoose? Right, question number six. It's a grass that I spoke about yesterday. Very palatable grass decreaser. This very typical inflorescence, a paniculate inflorescence. Those purple seeds are very, very distinct. Often grows in shade and under knobthorn trees along drainage lines. Very palatable grass, high grazing value. And it's an important grazing grass. Lots of leaves. It's also grass that are cultivated extensively for fodder. I remember I had it yesterday. Question number six. six. Which species of grass? And you can give me the scientific name or the generic name. We'll take all of that. Question number six. What grass species am I holding in my hand? I spoke about this yesterday. Give you a hint. So think about those questions. And on our next segment, we'll discuss the possible answers for all of them. It's again time to head back to my, my good friend Rex, who's out on a bumble. Welcome back from Chris. Uh, we are right here in uh, Sandy Page North where we are expecting the wild dogs have moved into the area. If not, uh, they might be straight to the north. But I believe that uh, due to the weather today is changing a lot, wild dog might prefer to be, if you look at uh, our right hand side here, it's really a perfect area. It's and a section here where the um, wild dog would love to be in this surrounding, especially into the open like this. As you can see, if we look at you, our right here, we have a steel book which is lying down. The Safari Guard of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guards at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. I can see a single impala here chasing the female, still mating. I believe that uh, the late pickers are still really wanted to be mated with this dominant male. But uh, of course, <laughs> it was the end of the season because you cannot hear the commission of the impala ramming and rocking in the area. Let's continuously heading north. Maybe we might have an evidence of uh, wild dogs in the surrounding. Who knows? Maybe they might be still around in the area. It's a very perfect weather. They might be successful by this time and lying down. If not, they might be still continuously hunting. You know that uh, wild dog hunt a lot in the overcast weather like today. It's really, really um, important to work around, especially if there's any evidence of uh, being in the area. It will be easy to find them because they will be running and get separated listening you can hear them calling whooping like a dog sometimes you can really get that from even uh, from 
three to four kilometers away. Once they want to get together after being separated in hunting, it's easy to find wild dogs. And this is a perfect environment. You can see, if you look at the area as I've chosen to come and check here, it's more open. And the dogs, cheetah, likes an area like this because they can run down the animal without disturbed by the environment. This is the area preference of Tawangume also. Tawangume like a lot this surrounding. We're not sure whether the, the signal we're able to hold. We'll go and check towards this overcast here. It's very foggy, starting to be misty around in the area. It'll be a little bit difficult to see by your naked eyes, a little bit far. Linda, sometimes this is it's it's very complex to understand between wild dogs. Let me uh, yeah, stop here before I lose you. Then you, you tend to see sometimes wild dogs and uh, 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 hyenas fight a lot, but sometimes you tend to see wild dogs have preference of certain characters of a hyena, even coming close not to fight back. So. According to my experience, it could be the individual behavior of a hyena that uh, really have a reputation from the wild dog itself and tend to be not going um, crazy with that particular individual or fight that particular individual. But in most cases, you see interaction of wild dogs that is practically common. If a wild dogs have a kill and a hyena comes, they all gang together and try to push the wild dogs off. As depending on the number of wild dogs that might be, it will really uh, fight back from the dogs. That is very common. But at the end, what does wild dog would leave and leave the uh, I mean, remains of impala or whatever, and let the hyena take over. That is very common. But finding them fighting for no reason, I haven't, find, I haven't seen them. But in most cases, hyena will always follow these um, wild dogs. And sometimes I have seen wild dogs fighting with the hyena where from over the kill, which is very common. The lions do that, a leopard do that, everything do that. Once it's a kill and one is more like, more desperate to get in, they'll fight. But in most cases, a number of wild dog wins. It depends how 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 individual, how many individual of dogs within the uh, pack. If they're over 10, 12, they're always able to uh, win and control the kills away from the hyenas. So it, it, it do happen quite a lot. Uh, it can say a hyena can really wait until wild dogs move, but they'll sometimes there will be sometimes and let's take this opportunity and link to uh cedric he might be down uh south at the moment trying to be lucky for something Yes, uh, just uh, on the dead tree there, we've got like a, those green woodoopers. There's one that's just busy searching around. Oh, there he is. Beautiful, with those long beaks. And uh, many times they'll go around to those dead trees, and especially with those wood-boring uh, beetles, where, of course, they kind of lay the eggs and have those little larvas inside of the, the tree trunks. You'll find that these woodoopers, they've got the perfect beak to really dig. Oh, a little squirrel's getting irritated by that. <laughs> And it's got a long red beak, and they actually put those beaks in those holes and to pull out those little grubs uh, from these dead trees. Uh, they are in family groups. I think the rest is just... Let me figure out where... I think the rest will just flat it off now. Uh, one or two still, still around. There's another one in the, one of the other little trees here on the side. One of the combretums. You can see how they're just looking and searching and every little crevice there and every little crack and the uh, hole just for any little insects, so they are insectivorous. And what I love about them, they are they're really very much family orientated, so they work together as a little family, and they'll move from a dead tree 
to dead tree or, you know, some trees, of course, that's got dead branches on. And they'll just search around there. Little green woodupoos. Used to be known as a red billed woodupoo. And they've got those striking red beaks. But of course, uh, they changed that name to a uh, green woodupoo. And yeah, they look quite dark and black here, yeah, but uh, if they get that sun hitting them perfectly, uh, that beautiful green shimmer color comes out. And that's where they get the name from, a green woodupoo. Uh, they've got a, a cousin called the Semitable Woodupoo, and of course, he's just a more of a solitary Woodupoo, where your green Woodupoos are, of course, uh, family orientated and family groups and family flocks. And uh, in Shanghai, we call it a makakling mafazi. Makakling mafazi, because when they make that noise, they go, and a makakling mafazi means a uh, talking woman. So when ladies are sitting at a tea party and they talk, I call it a makakling mafazi. Anyway, let's uh, head down towards uh, Chitwa Dam, slowly but surely. Looks like, uh, looks like they've uh, decided to fly off further. But yes. Uh, in that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as me. <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. Yes, uh, it's just yeah, in this jackalberry tree, we've got a beautiful crested barber that's just busy looking for a little uh, jackal. Oh, sorry, I just heard the fish eagles there. Eh? There's just another crested barber on the ground, I think, hopping around. I think they're looking for the little seeds that's uh, falling from. Oh, sorry, cut. Yeah, the, yeah, with birds, you gotta, yeah. <laughs> Especially with us, for some reason, uh, every time we try and pan onto a bird, they, they know that the camera's on them and they just uh, fly off. But uh, yeah, the crested bobbits are beautiful. They're always uh, looking for those little berries and seeds and fruits that they do feed on. All right, well, we're going to continue down towards uh, Chitwa Dam as we are on Chitwa at this point in time. Uh, let's head over to Chris on Bushwalk. Okay, hind foot of this mongoose, about five centimeters in length. You can see that pad that's got that sort of almost like crease lines, almost that intermediate pad is divided into three, not lobes. Amazon and Laura, I'm impressed. Got it right first time, bandit mongoose. Right, let's look at it, let's look at it. There we go, right. This is now just the right foot, but you can, you can clearly see, there's nothing you can confuse it with. The pad, it's not very visible there. And then those little toes, pad, toe, toe. And then look at the proximal pad, you can clearly see those creases there that I was t telling you about there and there. Then the sausage shaped toes, long blunt claws, and often fuses as an imprint. Right. Sometimes can be confused with the slender mongoose. Right. If you look at slender mongoose, similar structure, but that fifth toe much smaller, the pad much smaller, not as big and pronounced. Toes tiny, more spaced, and then the key there is sharp claws. The slender mongoose is a hunter of birds and all sorts of things in trees. So it's not a digging mongoose. All right. Dwarf mongoose, obviously much, much, much smaller. 
it will be more than half the size. So that will be abandoned. Mongoose, 100% right. So therefore, question number five, which is the other gregarious mongoose that lives in groups out here. That should then therefore be an easy one. And I'm gonna reveal the answer. Uh, I just wanna get you that grass. I thought everybody will get that right then. Forza and Jackie says dwarf mongoose, 100% correct. So therefore, if you had number four right, banded mongoose, answer to number five then will be a dwarf mongoose. That is correct. Those are the only two gregarious mongoose in our area. Question number six. Remember the grass I spoke about yesterday? We haven't got any answers for that, so I'm gonna reveal it. Remember, I spoke about grazing value yesterday. We had a question about the herringbone and I pulled out this grass. It's got a paniculate inflorescence, as I refer to, branched paniculate inflorescence, purple seeds, good leaf production. One of the most important grasses out here. This is panicum maximum. So your answer, if you said panicum or panicum maximum or guinea grass, or white buffalo grass, not buffalo grass, white buffalo specific, that would be a correct answer. It's a decreaser, which means it decreases its population when there's over and under utilization of the plant. It is also a subclimax and a climax grass, important grass for us, high grazing value, even when it's dry. Very important, very important. So panicum, guinea grass, panicum maximum, white buffalo, I'll take all those answers. Hyena and hippo walking side by side, terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash, hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping, it's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Damn, let's conceive there's some aquatic things that we can look at. Okay, mm. on the route to Leopardam, in the meantime, sorry about that. Let's head to Cedric on his bumble to see if he's found anything interesting. Oh, yes, as you can see, we are at Chitwa Dam. Got a, one of the big crocs could be Vlada or Boris, or one of the two that's busy swimming. And it's drifting through the water here towards uh, the one side of the dam. It looks like getting towards the area where those little crocs were left. Pretty much uh, right at the end of the dam wall. But yes, it is not that warm, so they're not really... I think it's just really using that thick muscular tail just to swim easy along. But as you can see, quite a misty morning. It's all of a sudden the mist has really come in quite a bit. It has, it's, got a, look, it's quite a beautiful setting with that mist. And uh, I think it is getting a little bit chillier than the, than the start of drive. And of course, we've got all our hippos, our, our chitwa pod, that's uh, enjoying the early morning's antics and still... A few, there's quite a few youngsters in this pod. There is absolutely, I think there's like four or five young ones that's been seen around here. Yeah. And I love the young ones because they're always uh, full of it. And there is one very small one. I think that little one might be with one of those females to the left there. 
But yeah, you can see that must. It's amazing how quickly the the temperature changes, and there's a the scenery with uh, with this uh, weather that we are having here. A good old winter's morning. These young little hippos are quite curious and see what they, where they're going to go now. Let's see, it looks like they moving up and down here in this water, and a lot of a lot of activity. Joey, good morning. Yes, definitely a, a very peaceful scene this year at uh, Chitwa Dam. Uh, especially uh, with this uh, mist that's come in. Um, we also got those two male line tracks on Chitwood Dam Wall. Looks like going south as well towards uh, the southern side of uh, Chitwood Dam, maybe towards uh, Nets area. But yeah, uh, we also got a beautiful green backed heron also doing his little morning hunting. Uh, doesn't Looks like he's more kind of sitting there and warming up. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet, and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool. <laughs> He's got some accessories on his nose. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> uh, Nikki, good, uh, oh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. How long can a crocodile survive out the water for? Well, uh, Nikki, uh, uh, for a very long time. They don't really need to go into the water as often as the hippos with their skin. So as you must remember, uh, crocodiles actually like being out the water on very hot days, are ectothermic, and uh, of course they do gather that heat up from the sun, so most of the day they will sit outside if they have to, to really uh, raise their body temperature. So yeah, look, they can stay out of the water for quite some time if they have to. Um, I mean, some crocodiles will actually move from dam to dam, and could take them a day, could take, take them two days to get to another watering hole. Um, so it's uh, not saying that they have to be like fish and have to go into the, the water. No, uh, they can they can survive for some time out the water. So yeah, it's so, like unfortunate with the hippos itself. See the hippos, are the, the epidermis is very thin and very sensitive. So you'll find that um, hippos have to keep their skin pretty much uh, wet uh, throughout the hot days. And if they don't, they see their skin is uh, their skin will start uh, like kind of breaking up or drying, and then breaking up and cracking, and that could be a little bit uh, detrimental to the hippo. But for the croc, their skins are very tough and uh, very coarse. Uh, I see that uh, croc is heading back again across the water. Looks like he's heading. He did go to the right, and now he's heading back left. I don't know which one it is. It's one of the. Uh, the big, uh, big crocs. I oh, know they've got the two. That's very, well, the two large ones there. Yeah, but it is one of them, one of the two. And this, you can see just gliding through, just like a submarine. Eh? Very much, uh, not, not uh, many ripples, no splashing. Just really gliding through the water. Oliver, good morning. What predator will eat a crocodile? Well, Oliver, if it's those small little crocs and uh, not the large ones at all, um, you'll find something like the Marshall Eagle, uh, African Hawk Eagles, they'll go for them. Even the monitors, a big um, Nile monitor, 
if they find those little baby crocs, they all go for them, they'll eat them. They've got so many predators. Uh, unfortunately for those little baby crocs, they are uh, very much uh, preyed upon. I think only about 5%, 10% of them survive. So it's a very poor uh, percentage of uh, survival for the young ones. Uh, for those like Boris and Vlada, uh, they are very large. Um, I don't think many, thing, well, many things will prey upon them. I think they're at that uh, size where um, yeah, uh, not many animals and not many predators will uh, take a chance to go for those uh, crocodiles. So yeah, I think they are pretty much in the safe zone. But if there is a lot of crocodiles and if there is a lot of competition in rivers, in dams, you'll find that that'll be a bit of a problem then. But it's just the two of them, so there is no, uh, there is no competition this side for them. As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new dive live merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. That's got a hyena calling in the background. And while we continue sitting here, just uh, seeing this mist coming through, let's head over to Rexon to see how his safari is going. Welcome back from Cedric. We are here at Twin Dams. I can smell, I mean, it looks like a, a very strong scent of a leopard that uh, might be in here. You never know what time. It could be early this part of the morning, around uh, 2 o'clock. But uh, try to uh, check here for tracks. The, the soil here on the road is very compact. You cannot see tracks easily. But um, with this information that I'm smelling, uh, it looked like, uh, yes, there was a leopard activity around in the area. And as it could be uh, Mulawati or it could be Talaba, I cannot uh, really tell from the scent. Uh, but I believe that uh, if there's any leopard from where we're going, we might be able to find the information from the ground. Uh, if it's turned the earth to Lamba, we'll be able to follow up and see where, where she was moving to. This is the last area where she was seen moving straight to the east from Ingo Ely, Twin Dam's direction. So to follow up easily in the area. It's a perfect day, of course, perfect weather. I would love to follow tracks, more especially leopard tracks if it's very fresh lot more easy to find a leopard. It's very misty. Of course, you need to check on the trees. Be very careful. You know that uh, if it's overcast like this, lions, leopards, wild dogs are a lot more successful because it really gives them more strength to, to hunt without getting exhausted to the uh, heat. There also, there was some buffalo here looking like they were moving in the right direction. From last night where we saw them, they came from this direction and headed west. We're also going to go and check on those areas. Maybe we might be lucky finding lines behind them. We 
only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. In winter, I find uh, hyenas try to gang together and try to focus on a big uh, antelope. This year it looks like uh, it will be a little bit difficult to find that kind of a behavior due to the uh, of, uh, water and also food around in the area. It looks like uh, there's a lot more food around here. Very shocked here. There's uh, a wild dog tracks moving in the same direction, but not fresh. Again, it could be the same tracks that we spotted uh, further to the west. Look like these wild dog, they've been here yesterday and they've spent some time in our property and we were not lucky to find them. There's reason there's a lot more tracks of hyenas everywhere around this property, but they finally tracks of uh, fresh hyena uh, tracks. It was Impala Plain heading south and Wu Road heading north. So it could be the sign, but the dogs looked like they were here early in the morning. Let me find the... Not easy, but on the other side of the road. While we're following these tracks of uh, wild dogs, let's just uh, go over to Chris on the bushwalk and see what's up to. Welcome back. All right. Let's get cracking. This tree, very typical of the bark. Very, very fine, biopinately compound leaves. Characteristic long white thorns, and they've got little hook thorns as well. All right, usually umbrella shaped. And my question is not what species this is. I'm gonna tell you what it is. This is an umbrella thorn, one of the most common thorn trees in Africa. The scientific name for it is Virgilia. Tortillas. So I want to know this group of trees. So question number eight is um yeah seven actually. Question number seven. This group, the Virgilia and Senegalia species. We've discussed this a few times. What were they known by formally? What was their formal or former uh, a genus name? So. A we, we call this particular thorn trees a certain group of trees, and that name has changed into two separate names, the Virgilias and the Senegalia species. All right, so we have discussed that a number of times. I'm sure this is not too, too tricky. So question number seven, what's the previous name in terms of the group or the genus of this Virgilia or Senegalia species, in this case the Virgilia tortillas or umbrella thorn. Right, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, we had a little dung and I explained about this particular class of organisms, how you can distinguish their dung. So I'm just going to quickly show you the piece of dung. You can see there's a very distinct dark blackish bit, very coarse, with this white covering on the one side. The question is not what species, what group of, it's actually a whole class of, in, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, vertebrates, 
which means they have a spinal. So what class? So it would be, to give you a hint, we want to, we want to know the entire grouping of this particular organism. What organisms dung is that? Not the species, I want the group, the wider group of that. Right. So that will be question number eight. What entire group actually we refer to as a class of vertebrates or animals have this? Okay, very distinct. You got that. Remember that they sort of uric or urine and the dung goes through the same orifice when it's excreted. Right, a while back we had a flower and I'll show you the flower. And we had this question, or well, this plant that we discussed. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Hullabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hyena at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of hyena celebrations. Flower. There's even a town. outside of the sabi sand it's called justicia so the justicia flower don't know the common name of it yellow flower the question is what part of this plant is being used as a food source that's question number 10. so just to recap number seven which is the former name for the tree number eight what group of animals made that dung and what part of this justicia flower is used as a food. Right, while I wait for answers, let's go over to Cedric. Yes, as you can see, this elephant's got a very, very small trunk, very thin trunk, a very strange looking trunk. No, I'm just joking. That's just his, uh, the other trunk at the, the back end of uh, this big male elephant. <laughs> it looks like a trunk, one trunk in the fr uh, back and one trunk in the front. But yeah, that is a nice male elephant. He is slowly <laughs> so moving towards, looks like a Chitwa bush bry. And uh, a very relaxed male. Of course, he, there is no other males and no other elephants around here, just besides him. As you know, sometimes elephants do move around uh, pretty much by themselves, especially the older ones when they don't really need that experience anymore, like the younger males. You'll find these older guys will just uh, tend to uh, wander off by themselves and um, one day going into must and then, of course, looking for some females. But, yeah, he is definitely enjoying a couple of the cluster leaves around here and also some of the compretums. But it's always nice to see them eating these cluster leaves, especially the cluster leaf is quite an encroaching species of tree that we have around the side. Not many animals do eat it, but uh, it seems like the elephants are enjoying it at this time of the year, really pulling them right out of the ground and uh, going for the roots. But sure, oh, this mist is really coming in now even more, so I think uh, we won't even be able to see four or five meters in the next minute or two. It's coming. This is amazing, and now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's the elephants have huddled up to 
protect the young ones in the middle and he's going after that girl and they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness they're still going after them look at that guy charging hey Lawrence, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the knife symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. Misty, misty, misty morning, misty, misty morning, misty, misty morning. But uh, yes, there was a report of a male leopard tracks coming down from uh, Torchwood into Chitwa towards uh, Elephant Tusk. So I am going to just go take a look that side and uh, see. It might be my that will be coming down there. Uh, sorry, Chulu, I did not copy a single thing there. Please repeat that question. Good morning, good morning. Well, look, the mist is just, of course, uh, the drop, uh, drop in temperature, of course, the air pressure as well. So you'll find that's why early mornings, you'll find that the clouds, the misty clouds, will actually start forming a little bit like a thicker, we almost say fog. I know that uh, Liam was telling me the other day that fog, fog is, uh, you can see, I think, uh, <clears throat> more than 100 meters and mist you can see under the 100 meters so this is definitely creating a, like a misty effect and um, it's just of course uh, your, kind of, your clouds is just really kind of forming a little bit further down and lower and the temperature of course the drop of temperature uh, creates uh, this hazy misty feeling in the morning so yeah it's but it's not too much because the sun is coming through so it is sitting, it's sitting lower now because now the sun is starting to appear more so so we're almost kind of above uh, the misty layer at this point of time so of course the higher we're going uh, the better it'll become with the misty uh what can i say the visibility but yes, let's uh, get a search for this uh, male leopard tracks. I'm hoping it is Marips because Marips did uh, go into uh, Torchwood from uh, Lidwood Junction. He did cross into uh, Torchwood and I'm thinking he might have uh, just turned this south towards Chitwa. Because he does, for some reason, uh, Marips is loving Chitwa at this, uh, at this time of his life. Um, I don't know because we don't really get any other male leopards around this side where we... I mean, Molawati, I don't know when last Molawati was seen on Chitwa. So maybe he's seeing that this might be a little, a nice little area for him, a safe area for him. So, and I know only Kashaba is most, seen most of the time this, um, on this uh, property. But here, yeah, let's take a look. And uh, oh, my, even my eyelids have got little dew, uh, like little drops, like dew drops on them. Uh, my, it's like all over. It's like actually very. Very musty now, but it's very pretty. And also the temperature has dropped. Definitely the temperature has uh, dropped a bit from this morning's cloud cover. Well, we're going to continue to find uh, this uh, young male leopard's tracks. I'm hoping that we can uh, just find the tracks so we can actually start working on it. Um, let's head over to Rexon and see how his tracking is going. Welcome back from Cedric. We are right here at uh, Zoe's Road. Uh, we can witness, uh, look like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, six impala. All of them are adult and look like they're separated from the the bigger picture of the head itself. And looking at those tracks of uh, wild dogs that we are trying to follow up, it gives us guarantee that the wild dogs, they've been in the surrounding and now the impala, they're still a little bit more concerned going back in the area where they've been really flushed 
out and head into the thicket like this. And we have seen tracks of this wild dog very close to quarantine. We check at the quarantine, there's no tracks. But the guarantee of the tracks, it looks like they were headed west, that's reason we are coming into the spot here to check if there's any tracks. Hello everyone from sunny Namibia. My name is Cameron Pierce and this year I'll be representing Ongava Game Reserve at the Safari Guide of the Year 2022 edition. You know, a lot of people have asked me what it would be like to win the competition and it would obviously be an incredible privilege, but uh, even just to be selected as one of the five finalists is an honor that I, I never expected and special to be a part of it for this year. My name is Liam Henderson. I'm a guide at the Homestead Lodge on Nambiti Private Game Reserve in KwaZulu-Natal. I think Safari Guide of the Year is a great competition to be a part of. I'm somewhat nervous for the tracking part of the competition as being in KZN now, uh, I've been, haven't been exposed to the low felt animals and tracks and signs that are so apparent up there. We we had Zoe's road west of quarantine. And I see they look at the Impala. They're still showing concern to the west. Maybe it could be the last direction of the dogs or where the ex I mean suspecting the dogs might be. We'll, we'll, we'll try and let's try even using the sense of a smile. One of the Impala there was trying to lift the head up a little bit and try to breathe in if he can get to read the scent of wild dogs through to the wind. But it will be difficult from the area. So we have to work the area, go back in a certain area where we believe the dog might be and maybe we might be lucky, who knows. We're continuously heading to the south and this is a medium sized antelope that we have in the area. In most cases, seeing them like in small numbers, yes, guarantee the dogs have been here because dogs likes to hunt impala the most in the surrounding. And remember, this is the common antelope that you might find in the area. Everywhere you drive around here, you'll find the impalas. Let's continuously head and check on Belanati Junction, Zoe's Road. If there's no tracks, we'll track all this where the road intersect because the road will be leading quite a lot of all predators at the moment uh, to move from one part to another. But it is a great concern if you look at the uh, animal behavior or this impala behavior. It tells that, uh, yes, they've experienced wild dogs in the area, something that uh, Really, we have seen the tracks and it looked like they were hunting because the dogs were running on the road heading coming this direction to the west. I feel more lucky to drive around here. Maybe I might find the dogs, but if I find the tracks now, I will manage to find them. And there's uh, information on the road here. Yeah? Look like uh, there's an elephant bull that is in mast. He's urinating on the ground all the time. It might be heading in the same direction where we're going. Who knows? The Tata Span tracks is coming from the south and headed west. They haven't crossed Triple M, guys. It's between Triple M and Sandy Patch. It's very thick on that area. We have tried to, to work the area. No tracks crossing to the west. Maybe they might be on a kill or it might be lying down. Who knows? You can tell there's still another few impalas that ties in the area. But all of them facing the west. Something that uh, they're not happy from the west. You look at the body uh, post of this or body language of this impala. They don't want to even move far from the road because it's where they can see better if an enemy coming from the distance to the thick, they show concern. So 
more or less we're gonna work the area the behavior of this impala give us guarantee and the way they separate it give us guarantee that uh, there is something around an area that we have to check or if if you look at this more impala they're even more concerned than the impala that we've seen before which uh, they were very close they've seen the dogs uh, around the area but all of them facing looking to the west which something to the west that we have to go and investigate uh, My name is Nico Britz. I am originally from Cape Town. I worked in the Eastern Cape for about nine years before I started working at Bushwise Field Guides in the Low Felt, uh, close to Makalali Private Game Reserve. So I'm hoping that by doing this, this could inspire the younger or newer guides coming into the industry to do the same. Hello everyone, my name is Ruan Groble. I'm from Lion Sands Game Reserve and being nominated for the Safari Guide of the Year came as somewhat of a surprise to me. I was very excited and quite nervous as well in the beginning uh, to tackle this task, but it's, it's, it's quite a prestigious event and it, it means that you are recognized and I'm quite happy to be recognized. It means quite a lot to me. We might be coming back quickly into the area. It looks like uh, tracks of tortoise pan is coming back from where we suspected the tracks went because around Sandy Patch it looked like uh, disappear before Sandy Patch uh, West is coming off from here. Tracks of him is coming off from here. Look like it's going to the south. We'll, we'll quickly check uh, Impala Plains. And let's take this opportunity back to Chris. Question number seven, we asked, this is the umbrella thorn, currently known as Virgilia tortillus. So there's another grouping that's similar, the Senegalias. So what is the previous genus name or group name for this group of thorn trees? It was changed a while back, can't remember the exact year. Got to break up in communications. Uh, can ask our mission control to just repeat that for us. Joy in Hong Kong says it's in Acacia. There's a Quite a number of correct ones as well. Yes, so this was previously known as Acacia tortillus. And a general group name was Acacias. And Acacias is a genus that's found South America, Africa, into the Middle East, parts of Asia, as well as Australia. And the decision was made to separate the African ones into two separate genuses where the ones with the long thorns and the round flowers placed in the chilia, the one with the hook thorns with the long spikelet flowers chased in, placed in the genus Senegalia. Uh, this one being the kicker, it's got both the long and the curved thorns, but it's got the round buff ball, therefore the chilia. Correct, very well done. Right, let's get down to our bird. Oh. I gave it away. Okay, I'm going to give this one away because I want to get back to the justicia flower. So the answer on this one will be birds, the class birds. So birds, 
not the only ones who don't do it, but unlike us, they don't have a separate uh, digestive opening anal area for food. So West Costa and Amazon also said birds. Thank you very much. Very good. Yeah, so basically the 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 uric, you know, urine and the feces come out as one sort of pellet and the white being the uric acid from the urine and then the actual feces is the dark little black, dark little spot. So that is correct. If you said birds, that's the answer there. Or a bird, also the right answer. Justicia, flower, that yellow flower. Let's see if anybody got it wrong. Oh, all right. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we did do the edible plants afternoon. And I did discuss which part of this plant can be used as a food. And it's plucked and added to soups, especially the part of the plant. Laura says the seeds, good day Laura, unfortunately the seeds in the light there are not correct. The one part of this plant that are extensively used for food is the leaves. Not necessarily cooked as a spinach, just a bit of a herbaceous flavor to it, not unpleasant at all, but it is added to soups, the leaves as an extra vegetable to soups, broths, soups, etc. I've tried it before, very pleasant, not a very distinct flavor. I would say it's edible. There's a lot of other plants that are, uh, that, that makes fantastic spinach. Uh, and you can probably do it with these, but yeah, it's better to add them to a soup. Got some good nutrition to it. Right. We got to, to 10 questions. I'm happy if we can do another five, I'll be even happier. So we're gonna walk around Leopard Dam in order to see what we can find, perhaps a few more tracks, that will be good. Good morning, Mike. Mike says he loves this very educational morning. Yeah, and Mike, that's what I like to do out at Brightlands. Uh, it's, you know, do a bit of a mixture between, you know, high profile species, viewing them like the lions yesterday. Sometimes a little bit of tracking, sometimes tracking something, actually tracking like the elephants the other day. Remember that, that sneaky little elephant that we had the other day, doing a bit of bumbles, game drives. I like to mix it up, you know, and then at times it's about learning as well. And even for me, I still find stuff out here that I don't know. Remember yesterday we had that moth caterpillar that I don't know. Still don't know which species it is. Can't find it. So it's, it's a mutual learning for all of us, you know. Let's get over to Juma to see who is following some tracks. from Chris on the bushwalk uh, we we are trying to figure out tracks of uh, a male leopard very fresh is cutting across look like uh, heading straight towards uh, um, quarantine from those impalas we've seen them a little bit more nervous they can scent the the leopard as reason one of the impala even raising his head and tries to sniff from the air try to get the, the scent so the leopard is somewhere but there's no road where the leopard went we'll try to go around from Flemont's cut line back to the area My name is Solomon Lobu. I am working at St. Peter Kruger National Park. 
I am very excited today to be one of the guys that have been nominated to select it to participate in the Safari Guide of the Year. I'm an activator. Uh, I like starting something, motivating others to become better uh, and positive. You know, I like to um, focus on the positive sides of the situation. Let's give the leopard a chance maybe on our way back he might be out of that block and headed to maybe close to the road. Who knows? The impala are not moving anywhere. Maybe the time we get here he might give us a lamb call to indicate want to know the hunting strategy of wild dogs. Uh, Kate, uh, wild dogs is one of the special, it's not like lions and leopard and uh, of course sometimes a cheetah. It's a little bit similar, similar with the, the cheetah. They run down the animal until uh, they catch it. Uh, but uh, wild dogs, they run the animal until they're exhausted and bring it down. So what does in most cases, they stalk and come close to the animal and sprint. It, it, it's such amazing wild dogs, how they do. You might find that a pack of 10, a pack of 8, two uh, dogs will keep on focus on the impala, the rest come behind. If they get exhausted, if the this is very clear area where you can see all of this, you might find the other two sprint forward and take over and chase. And those two, they'll remain stamming and coming behind, uh, not in a full speed, but really getting close is how actually it works until they bring the animal down. But um, in most cases, they the hunt in an open space within a period of uh, 300 meters, 400 meters, they normally bring down the impala because sometimes you find that the wild dogs they will spread out everywhere in the area and that confuses the predate I mean the prey species and uh, easily they can make a kill you tend to see dogs when they get to hunt impala I'll take an example of the impala they're not running as they chased by a cheetah and the lion they they're prone to and doing the high jumping and kicking the back legs and that shows the healthiness of the species and most of most of time it do help quite a lot when it comes to wild dog they can leave the species not to follow up and knowing that is a lot more stronger and try to select the weaker one and go for them but it's very interesting to see the strategy how it works they run down the animal until they're exhausted and bring down the wild dog are very fast you know that very fast mm. I'm reading at the same time talking to you it look like uh, there was buffalo running here but uh, there's no clear direction it look like they cross the road towards and come back in the area but I don't see any tracks of uh, lions in the area we'll, we'll follow up and see what it look like if there's no lion, we'll continuously checking for our dogs, but it uh, looks like there's been a big head of uh, buffalo that been in the area. And it looks like there was interaction here by the look of the thing. If you look at the ground, in many cases, I don't know what the panda can show that. In many cases, if you don't see the exact direction of the tracks of buffalo it means they were interacting if we look at the ground also from the both side grass are a lot more flattened it's not just because this animal way the safari guard of the year 2022 is approaching us rapidly 
This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. is asking if if I get correctly where the world are going to if the direction you want to know Lindy if it's that case we, we don't have general direction they everywhere around in the area they were coming west as reason we're checking polar plane first there's no tracks we're going back to triple M oh. Lovely, Lindy. Diseases that the wild dog might have in the area. Canon Staffa, a rabies, is the biggest enemy of uh, wild dogs around in the area. It's very common. There's reason they are checking wild dogs time and again in, in different areas. But that Canon Staffa or rabies is, is very common around in the surrounding. That's raising our, our areas very well protected. There's a fence between communities and the, the reserve that uh, if it's a, uh, the disease, more especially from domestic dog and other species, mustn't uh, really transfer to the wild dogs. Because remember, domestic dog, if they come across with the wild dogs, they might have um, rabies very easily and they can really wipe the uh, all pack in the uh, reserve if one of the dog able to contact with the domestic dog if you have any diseases like that. So it's very, very important to make sure that there's no domestic dog that cross the line called the red line because if you cross this to the community that is a red line is where you might have diseases that dogs might have, domestic dogs that must have. But it's really under control, quite a lot. You find the vet going to the community and try to vaccinate all the domestic dogs not to carry all those diseases. Taban again is very uh, common to find it like that way. <coughs> Sorry, these tracks here look like uh, uh, the same leopard that we were trying to follow up. He crossed right here into the west. Yes, it was uh, look like a uh, turtle's pen male crossed into the west. We're looking for the opportunity for him and also the dog at the same time. Let's continue, continue heading more to the north. The leopard have crossed over. We, we're looking for the dogs. Yeah, it look like tracks of the dogs are Then wants to go how far away that the wild dog can hear if I get it right. I have an itchy ear, sometimes disturb me to get the question right. There is quite a lot of uh, 
If you look at the way the dogs can respond, especially let me say, if it's one dog is calling from one part to another, uh, they, they, they can hear one another uh, fairly from um, one up to two kilometers easily, especially in a very, very overcast day. You tend to see the sun travel a lot. But in a very hot day, it's difficult because a lot of things that might be really taking place around in the area. And sound doesn't travel in a very hot day. But in the overcast, very wet ground, yeah, at least one and a half to two kilometers, they can really read one another and they're able to respond. Coming right here, let's take this opportunity and uh, go over to Cedric, which is putting something in the thicket. Uh, I hope uh, Rexon comes right there. I'm trying to come right here with the water buck. It just doesn't want to stand still. This water bug, this, this female keeps on walking away from us. Oh, I don't even know we're going to get a shot from here. Nah. Uh, I think. Nah. Sorry about that. I just had a nice uh, water buck one. Uh, of course, those antelopes with that beautiful white ring around the uh, bottom. And uh, uh, she's just, uh, I just... I just see an ear in a distance. Anyway, I'm hoping that uh, Rexton will come right with that uh, leopard, checking that leopard will be fantastic. Um, I am here uh, on a one-hour pan. I'm just uh, east of Mola Wanini. I'm still trying to look for that male leopard track. So we have found the male leopard tracks, but uh, it doesn't look like it's the, the freshest of tracks. I'm not going to try and follow up on something that I feel that it's already from uh, early last night. The uh, reason for that is that leopard could be way gone, way gone, especially male leopards. So I'll just... Uh, I don't know he was coming into this area. That's why I'm just doing the one-hour pan here. Um, this is where we got Marips the other day with that little Niala kill um, just off the Molawan Nini. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. Yeah, it's not the best of uh, areas for signal here on this one-hour pan road. I know that we do uh, now and again it'll uh, does got a little bit funny here, yeah? um, but I am. I've just stopped here now, just uh, not too far from the Mola Wanini, just to listen out. And as you can see, we've got a beautiful forktail, Durongo, is just uh, really enjoying and resting up here on this uh, beautiful branch. I was just trying to listen out there because I just want to find, because I know there is some kudus in the drainage line here and it, we, not too long ago we did hear a little bit of activity that was happening around the side. And I just want to see if uh, if we do pick up on uh, any of those alarm calls around here. 
Oh, I've got a little Puff, puff Back Shrike as well. I don't know if about Puff Back Shrike. It's... Very difficult to see it. But anyway, yeah, let's head back to Rexon while he's still uh, searching around for that leopard. I think we're just going to try and get ourselves into a better signal spot. Welcome back from Cedric. We, we, we've checked the area. We are trying to go back where we have seen the Impala showing great concern. We have seen tracks of a leopard leading out. But uh, I'm suspecting if I read these uh, two different tracks of a leopard, it's not looking the same. The one that uh, we just put it here and the skirt, it looks like the skirt is still steaming. It could be another leopard in the area. I'm not sure whether it's Mlowati or which leopard. If it's Mlowati, yes, we're not going to see him. But if it's another leopard, I'll go back directly where we have left the Impala. I'll be checking on top of this thermal mount. I might find a leopard in the area. I guarantee that because the tracks there, it uh, completely... The one here is very fresh, that one there. It looked like early part of the morning around... Uh, four to five o'clock in the morning. The tracks that we find here, it looked like it was like uh, 30 minutes, 20 minutes ago. That's raising the Impala also showing concern. This uh, head uh, down in the same location and try to look, or maybe driving and check towards from quarantine because the track look like uh, from here, it's already cutting straight to the uh, east. The uh, northeast from this point here is going that way. So it might come out from the Impala, or if not, continuously heading towards uh, quarantine and the western edge of quarantine and a tree line. Maybe we might be lucky there, or we might have squirrel calling, or maybe Impala. Who knows? It's not far, it will be the best start to scan around looking on top of the Termot Mount if it's anything. The Impala right here, they have to move, but the tracks... Judy, tracks is very easy to read, more especially if it's the first tracks what you see, because it's a uh, little bit foggy here, it means water. It will be really having quite a lot of uh, dripples of water on top. But if it's fresh, there's no dust, there's no water, there's no wind today. If it's uh, really old tracks, you will see there will be quite a lot of, uh, of course, uh, mice on top of the spotted Janet. What guarantee? This is Impala, they were all there. The tracks cutting like in this section. The Impala, they're moving from the road where they eastern part and moving to the western part and this impala showing interest like if it's something right here you can see now and then look at this particular female here she's even trying to check where i'm pointing and looking direction whether it could be anything and that surrounding she was showing a little bit of great concern although leopard uh, it can be in the area of that knowing exactly look at that uh, female she's trying to be more in the area where visible she'll try to check herself out what might be in the area what we'll, we'll do we'll take this opportunity because this is important the switching in between We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet, and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. 
Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth Explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. I never take this opportunity driving 100 meters and scanning the area and see if we, we might come out uh, with the good news here. But uh, I have a great concern. I've been driving farm and it tells me let me come back here and try to uh, look around. The yeah, Amulawati is not relaxed. It will be running away from the vehicle. But if there's any leopard that might be in the area, we'll be able to see. The track's directly cutting into the area. I'll, I'll go a little bit around. I can see there's a termite mine to our right. A leopard would love to go into the termite mine, but especially And let us take this opportunity while looking here over to Chris on the bushwalk. Okay, right. So where are we now? Question number 11. So we're only going to do two, two here. We're going to get to 15. So we're going to do two here. And the next one we'll do three. I said we're going to look for some aquatic things. Right, easy one. Need to give you an easy one. Big bird, no back claw, very well pronounced ball or intermediate pad. One, two, three very long toes. And we can clearly see there is a line there. I'm not going to tell you what that line is. Look at my shade. You can see there, at the, from there to there, it connects. There's a line that caused something there. That's a hint. Easy one. What bird made that track? Should be a relatively easy one. All right. Now, I'm going to up it a little bit. A track I have discussed before. Be gay. Work your magic here, my bird. Right. We look at a track here. Size-wise, about as long as my finger. About four and a half odd centimeters, five centimeters. One, two sight loss, very thin toes. And I'm gonna tell you it's not a jacana. There's a hint. It's too small. And the jacanas won't be here necessarily. So first uh, often this thing will be around these puddles. Long middle claw and then that off center long back claw. Here's the same creature or bird. And what we can also see here is Partial webbing, you see there, almost like it's just the first bit of the toe, the first third of it. Partial webbing there, you can see how it flattened the mud there. Partial webbing, right. So that is the diagnostic feature of that track. The general appearance, the jizz, general impression, shape and size. But that partial webbing, the off-center toe, you can see it's not in line and slightly at an angle, and then that partial webbing there. Literally, if you look at the toes, they, it's like right there. It's not webbed all the way. Right, question number 12 will be, what bird made that track? Question number 11 was the previous one. Question number 12, both of them are birds, and both of them are birds found in or around water. That is another hint that I'm going to give you. Laura says number 11. I just want to quickly come back. Laura, I want you to rethink this one. Remember uh, number 11. Big bird, no back claw. And that webbing is all the way up to here. Laura says it's a hammer cop. It's not. I just want to confirm whether it's this one that you referred to or the other one. But this is the one that's 11. 
can see the webbing right up to the tip of the feet. This one doesn't imprint that well, but there you can clearly see it. So if you say hammer cop on this one, it's incorrect. I'm gonna wait for one more answer, then I'll probably reveal it. Okay, I thought that was the case. <laughs> Laura, I know you, oh goodness, you're always on the ball with these things. Laura, the number 12, she meant, is a hammer cop. That is correct. That is 100% correct. That partial webbing, the general shape and size, correct. Hammer cop, number 12, that's the second one I've done there. That is correct. It's a very distinct track once you know what to look for. You'll never forget it. That is correct. Impressed. I know I've done the Hamburg track a few times. And still, I see people on tracking assessments getting it wrong, like guides and trackers. You know, but for me, maybe it's just the way I see it. It's a track that I will never forget. I had it wrong on my first tracking assessment, and since then, very seldom had it wrong. So the partial webbing is the key there. Then Kathy the Beans both says number 11 is in Egyptian goose. 100% correct. I would even have taken a duck or a goose. That's also fine. If, so if you said a duck or a goose, I will take that. It is an Egyptian goose. Uh, if you said a spurwing goose, I'll probably take it as well. They're just much bigger. And that's just because the track's similar, but it's much bigger than that, almost double the size. But obviously, from your perspective, you can't always get the real, the real size of it. So Egyptian goose, goose, spurring goose, duck. I will take all of those as the correct answer. Egyptian goose is the correct species. We don't see spurring goose out here, but in theory, they can occur here. All right. If you said anything else, yellow bill duck, red bill teal, those things are wrong. Right. To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new dive line merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to show you, now there's BK, but we might have one or two tracks here. Right. Just before we go to Rexon, who's looking at something, Paula, I just want to mention I'm trying to find that one curveball, that one that's going to bowl you out. Let's see. Let's go and see what Rexon's up to with his Impala in the meantime. Welcome back uh, from Chris. We are with this Impala. They're coming very friend of us. But what we have read here on the ground, that we are now, it makes sense. The leopard is on top of our vehicle tracks driving to the south. 
and now it looks like he's heading to the north. And this Impala does raising now. They don't want to move out of here. They come very close. There's so much showing interest, and it's really unbelievable. I was just thinking, seeing something there, but it's negative. It looked like there was a branch of the tree on the side of the Impala. But guarantee, it tells me that the leopard is not far. We had something sneezing not far from the point in the direction of these tracks of a leopard. You might find that uh, this leopard is trying to really get close to the Impala, but the Impala now, they're in a position where they can see both sides if the leopard comes into the area. But I believe in this kind of a, a behavior, I won't guarantee that it's Mlawati. It's in the nature of a leopard. Once he wants to make a kill, it can be so much difficult to spot. We were hoping to stand by here, looking all different directions, because now and then, what you can see, once the leopard, uh, Impala move, a leopard will pop up his head and check in a direction. But with the environment here, it stops us completely even to see that. It could happen that the leopard might be 50 meters away or less than that, but you cannot uh, know exactly which direction it might be coming from. And I decided, because after seeing the tracks, decided not to off-road in the area because I might really go to the direction of the leopard. And by so doing, I might help the impala to spot the leopard what might be. If we don't achieve this morning, we might come here in the afternoon and follow up because the impala are not going to move anywhere until the leopard shows its own direction where it comes from. If it's lucky enough, it might make it might make a kill. If not, the whole impala is going to run away. There's two groups of impala. The one is more to the north. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Halabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hyena at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of hyena celebrations. way into into the kill to eat get their fill in there as well but they're also going to be told off see it's lions are not great at sharing their food. okay guys let me just take in frustration out on the other lion but you see it was interesting of uh, Impala, they are like uh, 10 meters away from us. Coming with the vehicle, they will simply run away and to the bush. And now they're ignoring that because they know that it's danger in the area. They're not going to move. They're going to stay here until they're able to tell exactly what's going on. But if it's uh, a young male, I believe he will make a kill because if he finds himself getting close, he can sprint in a very short distance and make a kill. If it's an old leopard, of course it will be a little bit difficult for him because he will wait until the animal gets so close and pass on top of it and eventually he can make a kill. But being so old, it stands a very good uh, chance because the experience count there. Yeah, leopard, uh, if they're more experienced, they're more successful. Young males sometimes they tend to lose because if you're inexperienced, you cannot even able to really uh, do much. But uh, if it's Mlowati or any male like Totospan, he might make the kill so easy. Apart if it's, uh, of course, Maribs and the other young junior males in the surrounding, it will be so much difficult for them to make a move towards it. They use quite a lot of uh, the weather, like today, it was uh, overcast and also a little bit uh, foggy, and that it was a great opportunity. Well, now it's burning out. The Impala can see better, even far from the distance, 100 meters away, they can see what might be in the area. Eventually, if it's burning out, they might uh, 
tend to move slowly away from there or use the road or maybe into a thick bush. But to time and again, you tend to see them using the sense of a smile because they cannot see them and they use the hearing. Ears are twitching back and forth in order to listen for anything that might be walking in the area. You see, they're ruminating while they're still waiting for a leopard to show, listening, ruminating, doesn't uh, really disturb the hearing itself. If you look at the ears folding forward for the female, more especially the one in front, it seems like uh, she's picking more sound, more directly where she's pointing the ears towards the direction is where the sound might be coming from. But they're so clever. If you look at the way it is, they all look in a different direction. I might miss that FC. What uh, the best in Pala I ever seen? You can help that panda. You get the question right. FC, if you don't uh, mind, you can repeat your question. Steve, you, you asked what is the biggest impala head I've ever seen. Uh, Steve, uh, it depends. Let me say around quarantine, if the clearing is maintained very well, you, you'll see over 500 impala altogether, plus minus a good time of the season. Like uh, after... Uh, Bath, of course, like uh, around November, December, is where you find the impala tend to focus onto uh, clearing because the youngster, of course, need uh, great security. There's reason you find them all get together into a big, end, big open space where it's mowed, more especially the prefer mowing area, and that will advantage the youngster to run around while the mother are focusing. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Yes, of course, there will, there will be over 100, but uh, uh, time and again, each and every uh, calculated space of uh, two to 300, you can get another 300, 200, 400. Let's take this opportunity over to Cedric, who is his Nambambul. Maybe he might be lucky finding a leopard.
this could be Mlo Wati Mel here. Yeah. Uh, I know the easy that one. But it was Kalambo or any female leopard will be already seen him. Yeah. I see uh, driving close by here. I, of course, if it was Talamba, she will be already show off and, and able to follow up with him. But it looks like uh, it could be Mlowati in the area. Very difficult, just thinking, because the way the leopard uh, have moved in the area, top of our vehicle tracks, there's no way that uh, we weren't able to see him. We were so much patient listening uh, is nothing much that we can see let's try to head back towards the direction of um, quarantine maybe we might see something there was a lot of action early this morning maybe all the animal like uh, wild dogs are uh, all head out maybe they're gonna come out uh, if you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Well, it's not as graceful as, <laughs> as he's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed the marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. I can see the tracks there. Look like a leopard heading out in the direction of uh, the road. Who knows, could be the same leopard, could be not. And let's take this opportunity back to Chris on Bushwalk. Number 13, I think we're gonna go quickly because I might run out of time. Right, we're looking at this sequence of tracks. Over there, over there, a row of tracks, like a little train track. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you my hand. You can see the size. And there's a little bit of a curveball, look at that. The size of my hand, you can see it's not even broader than two of my fingers. But the very distinct row of tracks, two rows, and here we can see the individual little tracks as well. Chip, 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 chip. It's got five claws on the front foot, four on the back, and there's the key to what that might be, as well as the distinct railway, the two sets of tracks. And it's question number 13, righty. Question number 14. Look at this beautifully made track. Look at that. Okay, again, if you look at my fingers, you see it's not a very big track. Okay, got a pad, not three lobes. It appears like three lobes, but it's just the intermediate pad that's got two creases as well. It's not lobes like you'll have with cats. There's a hint. Not really visible claws. Sometimes in deep sand you see claws. 
and again, a bit around that old track, about this, just, just about the size of a, a man's thumbprint. All right, so that's question number 14. Both questions, what animal made the track? Okay, let's do number 15, the final one. All right. Okay, we have a bird. Three toes, distinct ball, long toe, two shorter side toes, and a back claw just shows the one imprint. Clear pad divisions, you can see it there, dip, 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 and a claw as well. Same here, ball, claw, this is a very nice track. There's the indentation there. All right, here's another one there. That's not showing, but anyway. What bird made that track size wise it's about the length of my the whole track is about two thirds of my finger you can see that some species in this group are bigger i don't need the exact species if you could just give me the family name that will also work so that's question number 15. 13 what made those little railway trackies 14, there's a little pad it, and then the last bird that we do. Right, let's go over to Cedric, who's fine. An antelope, while we wait for some answers. Yes, uh, definitely we've got a beautiful, in this beautiful drainage zone, we picked up on this beautiful male kudu and kudu bull. Um, not the oldest of bulls, but it is quite pretty. Oh, okay, well, looks like I to size you. He's been standing there for the last five minutes. <laughs> now he decides to walk. Uh, of course, they do enjoy these uh, thick uh, areas. Uh, they are pretty much primarily browsers, so they do feed on the leaves around here. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can see a little bit of him there. Very narrow horns, not the widest of horns. But yeah, it looks like all by himself. Uh, usually sometimes you'll find two, three, four males together. But, but yeah, no, yeah we're going to cruise. Uh, we're going to move on. As I can see, he has moved on. So he has moved on. And shall well, we shall then uh, move on. Yeah. Very thick in this area, still it's amazing how, I mean, it's still like the water on the side of the road. So there's still so much water underground and um, it's just pushing uh, quite a bit of the little streams on, like, you know, like it's on top of the roads itself. So definitely interesting for June. I think that's why we got so much mist this morning as well, with all this moisture in the air yeah, around with all this water on the ground. But yes, nice to see a good old male kudu. And uh, nice to see him just uh, enjoying uh, the green leaves around here. But yes, we are going to uh, head towards the Gallego Pan. I'm just taking a look here. I'm still trying to figure out if uh, hopefully maybe Mulawati might have stayed in the area, made a kill or something, and we could find something. But so far, no tracks, no signs of Valvim. So I'm sure he will just disappear as quick as we find him. see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture but I've never actually seen them even once they've caught one um, actually kill it. Oh there we go nearly got him. Hyena and Hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little Hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Maybe Hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby Hippo against all odds. Uh, 
I've just stopped here at uh, Galago Pan and just uh, enjoying the last uh, bit of uh, of the safari and enjoying just listening out for any nice bird calls or any sounds around him. But as you know, the Safari Guide of the Year Awards will be coming up very soon as well, from the 25th to the 1st of July. So it's from the 25th of June to the 1st of July. And there will be an award ceremony around on the 2nd of July. And of course, old Steve will be will be the host on that one. And of course, on the 8th of uh, June, between 6.30 and 7 o'clock, um, there will be a nice fireside chat with uh, Tristan. And it's going to be Ask Me Anything. So please stay tuned for that one as well. And of course, Hyena Week once again is coming up. So please send on your favorite hyena video clips to hyena at wildearth.tv before the 7th of June. So your clips can be televised and shown on the Safari Drive. But anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the comments the, this morning. And uh, of course, from Chris and BK in Pridelands, and uh, Rexon and Panda on Wendy, and of course, uh, Chulu in, uh, as a director at uh, Final Control, and Hat and myself. We do say thank you for joining us on our Sunrise Safari. And hopefully, we will see everybody for the beautiful sunset safari this afternoon. So please make sure that you do join us and have a wonderful day. And have a wonderful cat today. Hopefully we can find cats this afternoon. Goodbye. Discretion is advised.